We're always talking about the importance of looking at TSH and how that lab value range has changed throughout the years, has been debated for decades, and how we need a more narrow reference range for thyroid stimulating hormone lab values. But oftentimes we forget about the free T3 reference range and how that can impact cells, every single cell in your body to be exact. Oftentimes I'll get asked by patients, how do I get the T3 into my cell? I feel like it's not getting into the cell. And we could go down a big old rabbit hole of scientific jargon of me trying to explain to you what all that means and how T3 actually binds to its receptor and gets into the cell. But let's break it down in layman's terms so you can actually understand it. And let's know what you have to do to ensure that T3 is getting into the cell or to even look at your situation in a different way. It might not be that it's not getting into the cell. It might be that you just don't have enough of it. So free T3 reference range in most labs, this is just the majority of labs, goes from usually like a 2, 2.2, up to sometimes a 4, a 4.5, 4.4. And above a 4.4, you're going to get flagged. And if you actually hit below a 2.2, you're going to get flagged actually as low. Now I see many patients come in at a 2.6, a 2.8, they're told that they're normal. In general, in functional medicine, we say 3.5 or above is optimal. Another way to say it is in the upper quadrant of that reference range. Now, again, this is also a generalizable term because you might be one of those people that do better and we can actually get more of the T3 into your cell if you are above that reference range. So even in the free T3 debate world, we are still seeing practitioners such as myself saying, hey, there might be a patient that does better in the, not only the upper quadrant of the standard lab value reference range, meaning closer to four or 4.3 or 4.4, but we might have some patients and you might be one of them that do better at a five or a six where their measured free T3 dose or their measured free T3 lab without dosing it prior to the labs, leaving actually 18 to 24 hours like you should from the last dose of T3 medication, whether it's actual leothyronine, cytomel, or NDT containing T3, where that has an 18 to 24 hour gap between your last dose and the taking of your blood to test that free T3 level. Assuming that that is in place, when we test your free T3, you might do better above range. Because we always have to look back when we're looking at, does it get into the cell? We have the D1, the D2, and the D3 enzymes. They are responsible for transport and for conversion of T4 to T3. Now, many times you might have a patient, and I'll use myself as, a, as an example. You might have a patient that has low free T3 or free T4, I'm sorry, low free T4 is on T3 monotherapy, which I tell all of you when I'm on, I am T3 only. I have been for many, many years. I do not convert well or pretty much at all. If you give me T4, I will get worse. I will go into a hypothyroid state. So D1, D2, D3, they're responsible for transport. They're also responsible for a conversion of T4 to T3. You have a patient with a low free T4 on T3 only therapy. And let's say they still feel hypo. They still have hypothyroid symptoms. So it's almost like a non-thyroidal illness where all the numbers look good. They actually look good. They actually look optimal according to functional medicine, but the patient is still presenting with hypothyroid symptoms. And they were diagnosed in the past, they're on medication. There might not be enough circulating T3 in the body to compensate for that low T4. So the D1, D2, D3 enzymes, and I would have to look up exactly which one because I don't work with them enough to know exactly which one does what. But basically, if there's a low amount of free T4 in the body, that is okay as long as there is enough free T3. And if there is not enough free T3, organs and tissues will suffer. The heart, 
the heart is largely dependent on adequate amount, adequate amounts of the T3 hormone. So you have to have enough circulating free T3 in order to basically divvy it up, right? All these tissues and organs and cells are screaming for T3 because that is the active thyroid hormone. They don't want T4. They don't care. There can be enough T4 and as long as it converts to T3, everybody's happy. But if there's not enough T4 to convert, such as myself not taking T4, then you have to give enough T3 to make up for that. I don't have T4 over here converting to T3. I have to take T3 in adequate amounts to get that free T3 number up high enough that it gets to all my cells and my tissues. Now, many of you know I don't have symptoms. My only symptom is, is that I don't like the heat. I never have. I haven't for 20 years. I don't know whether that's just me or whether that's just a lingering little symptom of my hypothyroidism that my body just doesn't want to deal with. I don't like the heat. It's fall right now. It's cooler. I love this. Love this weather. My body loves it. So that's one lingering symptom. The other one is that I just don't sleep well. I haven't for 25 years. I always have to take something to get to sleep. Those are my only two symptoms. In the grand scheme of things and in all the patients that I work with, I'll take those two symptoms over debilitating fatigue, weight gain, the inability to lose weight, hair loss. So all in all, I have to say I am optimized. I am optimized. But my optimized is a low free T4 and a higher than normal free T3. So if I was a conventional doc looking at my labs, or you were a conventional doc looking at my labs, you would say your response would be based on your teaching and based on what you learned in medical school, your response in addition to my suppressed TSH would be, oh my gosh, we have to take this girl off of T3 medication or at least reduce her dose. We need to bring that TSH up We need to bring that free T3 down. She is hyperthyroid. Remember, you didn't even ask me my symptoms. She's hyperthyroid. And oh, look at that reverse T3. It's all the way down to a six. That's horrible. Her free T4 is non-existent. She's at a 0.8. She's hyper. She's absolutely hyper. And I'm not. So you have to look at the individual person, but you also have to look at the fact that I am symptom-free and I am optimized. So obviously what you are seeing in front of you, that suppressed TSH, the low free T4, because I'm not on T4, I don't convert. The low reverse T3, because I'm not on T4, so it can't convert to reverse anyways. And the higher than the cutoff for those labs, the higher than the standard lab value range, is my optimal. And with that number, it is getting to my tissues, it's getting to my cells, my kidneys, my liver, my heart, all good, all good. So test those, doc, they're all good. I need a higher level of circulating free T3. I'm not hyper, I'm not anxious, I'm not jittery. The, the inability to get to sleep is not for me being hyper. That was there even before I got diagnosed. So that doesn't come into play. You know when you're hyper. I don't have a racing heart. My heart rate is not through the roof. It is elevated. And that's another topic that we have gone over in the past where people say, my heart rate's too high. I say, what is it? 95. Well, that's because you're taking T3 and you're actually normal now as opposed to your low heart rate before. But I digress. My heart rate is normal. Blood pressure is fantastic. I am optimized, but I'm optimized with a higher level of free T3. So if you are one of those people, and some of you have reached out to me already with this question, if you are one of those people that say, I've been struggling, I've seen a bunch of different doctors, the T3 doesn't get into my cell, no matter what dose we try, no matter what we try, free T3 only, T3 monotherapy, no matter what, no matter what, the T3 isn't getting into my cell. That might not be the case. It might be that we need a higher dose of T3 for you and that your optimal Free T3 is above range. Now you have to find a doctor that's open-minded and that will be willing to try that on you because, and, and look at you as a real person, by the way, and ask you your symptoms to make sure that, or to differentiate whether you are hypo or hyper, to make sure that you are not going into a hyperthyroid mode with a higher free T3. 
that's the most important thing, looking at you as a real person, asking you questions, asking how you feel, asking you about your symptoms. But all in all, it might not be that the T3 isn't getting into the cell per se, it might be that there's really not enough to go around. So if you step back and you look at all of your symptoms, have any improved? So if you're one of those people that say to me, I went to a bunch of different docs, T3 is not getting into the cell, uh, I would ask you what symptoms have improved? Do you notice a little bit of a little bit of energy over here? Just a little bit, even 10, 20%. Okay, then the T3 is getting into some of the, your cells. Your heart's still beating, your liver's still functioning, your kidneys are still functioning. You have some T3 getting into your cells. It's just not getting into the cells that you want them to get into, i.e. weight loss. Remember that your body is really smart. It's going to make you survive before it gives you the benefit of weight loss. Like that's the last thing. Hair, very last thing on the body's list of things to make you happy about. It is going to take the T3 that it has, shuttle it into the cells for survival before it really cares at all about whether you fit into your skinny jeans this fall or whether you're growing long, luxurious hair doesn't care. So it might not be that the T3 is not getting into the cell. It might be that you don't have enough. It's getting into some of the cells, just not the cells that you want. Okay. Last thought with all of this is the other factors that come into play when we're talking about T3 getting into the cell. So what about your iron status? What about your your cortisol status. What about insulin? We always talk about insulin as a big component of T4 to T3 conversion, as well as blocking thyroid hormone from getting into the cell because an insulin resistant cell is so inflamed. An insulin resistant cell is pumping out inflammatory cytokines left and right. It's dumping fat into the system, not to be burned, but it just does that, that insulin resistance cell doesn't, it doesn't want to explode. It has so much gunk in it, it's so inflamed. So even insulin, high insulin levels, which 88% of us have, can prevent the T3 from getting into the cell. And if you think about it, if, the, the, if, every, if every cell has a receptor site on it for T3, and that cell is poofy and inflamed and unhappy and sick. Don't you think that that receptor site just, now this is not scientific whatsoever, just hang with me in this thought. Don't you think that that receptor site on the cell would get all bogged down and blurry and mucked up? So the T3 is not gonna, it's kind of like, hey, where are you receptor? I don't see you. There's a bunch of inflammatory gunk all around you right? So the T3 can't even find where it's supposed to attach to. That is so unscientific, but it's a great picture, right? It helps you to understand. That is my goal is to help you understand. The other thing to think about is when we measure your free T3, free T3 has variations. One of my favorite researchers, and I reference him often, is Bianco. Um, B-I-A-N-C-O. He has written papers for the last decade. I know he's doing a clinical study um, that started in 2018 on the benefits of T3. I reference him quite often in my work and the papers that I, I write as well. So Bianco says, this is back in 2014, Plasma T3 levels are relatively stable over time. Serum T3 is remarkably stable over periods of days, weeks, or months in healthy adult individuals, despite a relatively short half-life. For example, free T3 measured once a month for 13 months only varied within a small portion of the reference range. So TSH can vary. Free T3 stays pretty steady, unless, of course, you take your medication before you go get your test, which is, we already talked about that. Don't do that. In untreated subclinically hypothyroid individuals, uh, you'll see an elevated TSH, but free T4 and free T3 are still within the reference range. I'm trying to read some, some studies to you and break this down without reading the entire thing. Basically, free T3 
pretty much remains steady. And whenever we test that outside of you taking your medication before you go and get your labs done, it, it pretty much gives us a good reflection of what is actually going on in your body. Bianco, look up his studies. He's awesome. They are awesome. He's on top of his game. He's probably one of the one researchers that are going to save our butts in the thyroid world because his published published literature might actually be recognized by the medical community. And we may, in the next 10 to 20 years, see some changes in the medical textbooks to where doctors will be getting away from T4 monotherapy. In fact, I believe it was Bianco that said, endocrinologists know that T4 monotherapy will drop free T3 levels. Well, if they know that, don't endocrinologists also know the importance of free T3 in cardiovascular health, in kidney and liver function, and every single cell in your body? You would think. You would think. So the moral of all this and what we bring it all back around to is maybe the T3 isn't getting into your cell, but maybe you just don't have enough of it. And you have to look at all of those other factors like iron and cortisol and selenium and iodine and magnesium and all those important factors that, and insulin, high insulin, that could get in the way as well of both conversion and getting into the cell. Now I talked about D1, D2, D3. These, you can get a genetic test and it's actually more uh, available and efficient in the UK. It's like, uh, it's the one that Paul Robinson always references, Blue, Blue Horizon Labs, Blue something labs, that they actually do a genetic test to see if the, you have a, a SNP a singular nucleopeptide, which is like a blip in the DNA radar, if you have a SNP for conversion, so a SNP in the D1, D2, D3 enzyme for conversion of T4 to T3. It's not that readily available in the US. And then also with any genetic test, you have to remember it's not a hard and fast truth. It's not you have this and therefore you flat out don't convert. It's kind of like you have this, you may not convert as well. It's something to kind of think about and put in the back of your mind. Like this might happen, but it's not a death sentence kind of thing. So that goes across the board with any genetic test. But if you feel like the T3 is not getting into your cell, take into account all the factors that come into play with conversion, with shuttling it into the cell, with the cell's inflammatory response, like high insulin, and maybe you don't have enough T3, period, and your optimal free T3 level is above the reference range. Of course, if you have any questions, reach out to me. I'd be happy to jump on a call with you. You can go to my website at amyhorneman.com. Click on book a call. You will see an introductory video of how I work with patients. And then you yourself can choose a day and time and jump on a call with us. And we'll go over everything, all your questions, all that good stuff, and what it looks like for us to work together so that we can actually optimize you. How about that? Okay. Take care. Have a great day.